Hello everybody, my name is Ali Tohemi. I'm a lecturer of cardiology, Asset University Heart Hospital. Uh, today our presentation will be about what cardiologists should know about diabetes mellitus. And let's begin with a small introduction. Type 2 diabetes mellitus is a disorder characterized by insulin resistance and progressive decline in pancreatic beta cell function. Defective beta cell function occurs early and can be detected in individuals with impaired fasting and or postprandial glucose level. The UKBDS study indicated that by time of type 2 diabetes is diagnosed, individuals has already lost up to 50% of their beta cell function. And the decline in function also proceeds at 6% per year, which is 20 times greater than the explained by normal aging. So the cardiologist should uh, know the cardiovascular and other risks against the potential benefits when prescribing uh, medications. And first of all, we have to know how to diagnose a diabetes mellitus. We have a two classification, the WHO classification and the American Diabetes Association, which uh, are more or less similar with small differences. Uh, using hemoglobin A1C, it is recommended in American Diabetes Association that 6.5 A1C diagnose diabetes. And the uh, uh, fasting blood glucose, uh, more than 126, and two hours, more, more than 200 milligram per deciliter, and random blood glucose, more than 200 milligram per deciliter, can diagnose diabetes mellitus, provided that uh, they occur in three different occasions. And uh, uh, another entity, it's about impaired glucose tolerance. Uh, it happened when the fasting blood glucose uh, less than 126, but the two hour postprandial from 140 to 200 milligram per deciliter. And the impaired fasting occur when the uh, fasting blood glucose 110 to 125, and the two hour postprandial less than 140 milligram. And now we will begin about the traditional anti-diabetic drugs. First of all, the metformin. Metformin is recommended as a first line drug for type two diabetes by most international guidelines. The preference of, uh, of metformin uh, over the other drugs is based on its efficacy, blood glucose control, tolerability, and uh, safety. Moreover, the metformin has a favorable action on several risk factors, includes lipid, body weight, and blood pressure. And also experimental studies has, have been shown that uh, uh, the beneficial effects extend to the fibrinolysis and platelet aggregation. And let's begin with the efficacy. Up to the present, the UKPDS study is the most extensive study assessing metformin compared with other treatment. And it aimed to study the effect of glycemic control on both morbidity and mortality, uh, 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 cardiovascular morbidity and mortality in type two diabetes mellitus. Metformin achieved the same reduction in fasting blood glucose as it reduced hemoglobin A1C as did sulfonylurea and insulin, but in addition, it doesn't uh, induce a weight gain. And also metformin associated with fewer hypoglycemic episodes when compared with, with sulfonylurea or insulin. So metformin could confirm a cardiovascular protection beyond a beneficial effect of, uh, of the improvement of glucose control alone because the reduction of total and LDL cholesterol, triglycerides, body weight, and blood pressure. And this is the results from the UKBDS study. The metformin reduced the, the, any diabetes-related endpoints by 32%. The diabetes-related deaths by 42%. All-cause mortality by uh, 36%. And myocardial infarction by 39%. And all were statistically significant. And this is a meta-analysis in 2000, 2019 about metformin and its relation to all causes and the cardiovascular mortality with the coronary artery disease. It, uh, it was a big uh, meta-analysis, included almost 40 studies and almost uh, 1 uh, million patients. Uh, and it shows uh, a reduction in the cardiovascular mortality in favor to metformin versus non-metformin ARP. And also the cardiovascular events were statistically reduced uh, with metformin. 
And also this was consistent with uh, patients with baseline myocardial infarction. This is a special group of patients and also the metformin uh, was uh, dec decreases, decreases the uh, cardiovascular uh, events in baseline myocardial infarction uh, as well as in the patients with heart failure. So the conclusion of this meta-analysis the metformin reduces the cardiovascular mortality and all-cause mortality and cardiovascular events. So now uh, we, we talk about the safety of metformin. So it is an effective drug, but is it safe? Metformin doesn't predispose to contrast-induced nephropathy, but if renal function decreases while patients on metformin, there is a risk of lactic acidosis. Uh, concerns about uh, metformin-associated lactic, lactic acido acidosis have led to practice of metformin discontinuation prior to diagnostic coronary angiography and percutaneous coronary intervention. Uh, the evidence uh, uh, for safety of metformin has been reported in Cosmic Approach trial. This is this trial uh, designed to uh, reproduce the safety of metformin uh, versus conventional approach. And the conclusion was the incidence of serious adverse events was similar between two groups and the lactic acidosis was not observed. And this is another trial in 2020 about uh, uh, continuous use of metformin uh, 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 in diabetic patients with ST elevation myocardial infarction and uh, uh, will underway, undergo primary work continuous uh, coronary intervention. And the conclusion uh, was that metformin continuation after primary PCI in a STEMI patient provided that the, uh, the GFR uh, more than 30 milli per minute didn't increase the risk of uh, contrast-induced uh, uh, acute kidney injury. So uh, it's no need to, uh, to uh, postpone the metformin dose before uh, the primary PCI. Now we will begin with another group of drugs about sulfonylurea. So, so we have three generations here. First generation, uh, tolbutamide, uh, chlorpropamide. Second generation, uh, glibinclamide and glicazide. Third generation, glimipiride and glicazide MR. And the third generation uh, is considered a new uh, generation of sulfonylurea. Efficacy. Sulfonylurea expected to reduce fasting blood glucose by average two to two to four million more the, per liter, accompanied by decrease in hemoglobin A1C of one to two percent. And the UKBDS treatment with sulfonylurea achieved hemoglobin A1C less than seven in fifty percent of patients. And despite this impress, impressive initial response, only thirty-four percent of patients maintained at hemoglobin. A1C less than seven at six years, and this number declined to 24 at nine years. As you can see here, there is uh, always with monotherapy, especially sulfonylurea, there is a, a, a impressive decline in hemoglobin A1C, but uh, uh, by years, the uh, blood glucose level began to increase again. So uh, monotherapy worsens over time. Initiation of sulfonylurea treatment in patients recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes uh, and uh, their random blood glucose more than 300 and hemoglobin A1C from 9 to 10 is debatable because this type of patients have uh, what's called glucotoxicity. What's the glucotoxicity? It's inhibition of uh, beta cells of pancreas to induce uh, insulin in uh, hyperglycemic patients. So these patients may need a short term of insulin therapy before initiation of sulfonylurea. And now we talk about safety of sulfonylurea. So we know now, now it's effective drug, but is it safe? So there are uh, many controversies in the term of cardiovascular safety of sulfonylurea. And this uh, uh, controversy began in, uh, uh, in 1997 and in the report of a UGDP study, and said that tolbutamide therapy was no more effective than diet alone and was associated with increase in cardiovascular toxicity. So the UGDP discontinued therapy with first generation sulfonylurea because it increases all cause and the cardiovascular mortality compared with other treatment groups. Uh, although this trial was criticized by many authors, uh, but the question of safety and efficacy of tolbutamide and other sulfonylurea group of drugs were raised. 
And uh, uh, on opposite, the UQBDS group demonstrated that treatment of sulfonylurea shows a trend toward protection against myocardial infarction and augmentation, uh, then augmentation of cardiovascular mortality. So we can see here the debates. And finally, uh, GART uh, reopened this controversy again and demonstrated increased early mortality in patients taking sulfonylurea versus insulin or lifestyle therapy alone. Also, this uh, uh, trial of by GART has also a, a, a critical reappraisal because the study was retrospective, randomization was lacking, and uh, the study sample was too small. So uh, uh, why uh, we uh, are afraid of uh, sulfonylurea in cardiac patients, or why there is a debate? Because of the hypoglycemic impact. Because severe protracted hypoglycemia, especially with longer acting and first generations, sulfonylurea can lead to uh, dangerous outcomes. As a, a, a acute hypoglycemia induced by sulfonylurea might trigger ischemia and the cardiovascular events. And hypoglycemia and rapid changes in blood glucose have been shown to increase uh, the counter-regulatory hormones such as epinephrine, norepinephrine, which may induce vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation, and thereby ischemia. As we can see here in this meta-analysis, the mild hypoglycemia uh, uh, occurred less in metformin arms, uh, metformin arm is other than the sulfonylurea, and also this was consistent with uh, severe hypoglycemia, which occurred less in metformin arm. So sulfonylurea causes uh, mild and severe hypoglycemia. And the, uh, now we talk about the sazolidindiones or TZDs. Uh, TZDs also termed about uh, termed also glitazones. Uh, they are potent insulin synthesizers. So they not improve, uh, secrete insulin from uh, pancreas. They just potentiate the action of endogenous insulin. There is three types, troglitazone, rosiglitazone, and bioglitazone. However, despite clear benefits in glycemic control, this class also have fallen into disuse due to concern about their side effects and adverse, adverse events. As we can see, the rise and fall of TZDs uh, shown in ambulatory diabetes visit, it was uh, used in 6% in uh, 1997 and decreased by time to 16% uh, 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 by 2012. So there is a rise and fall of usage of TCDs. So the efficacy that trochlita uh, zones introduced in 1997 was, uh, was drawing from the market due to increased risk of liver failure from fulminant hepatitis. And rosiglita zone and bioglita zone were, were post-FDA approved in 1999. They lowered the hemoglobin A1C by 1%. They uh, don't cause uh, hypoglycemia like insulin or insulin secretogogues like sulfonylurea, and they can be used in combination with other anti-diabetic drugs. And also TZDs has, uh, have large and uh, effect on insulin sensitivity. As uh, an adopt randomized control trial, uh, rosiglutazone provided more durable glycemic control than metformin or sulfonylurea. And also the ACT NOW uh, study involved uh, almost 600 patients uh, shows that impaired glucose tolerance uh, had been uh, decreased uh, by bioglutazones and this led to uh, less uh, uh, progression of type 2 diabetes by 74%. And uh, TZDs are the most potent insulin synthesizer patient uh, would require a low level of indigenous and exogenous insulin to maintain aeoglycemia. Regarding safety of uh, TZDs, there is a great concern with rosiglitazone than bioglitazone. Uh, there is an important meta-analysis in 2007 uh, involved almost a quarter of a million of patients and concluded that the rosiglitazone was associated with an increased risk of stroke, heart failure, and all-cause mortality in patients aged by six, uh, 65%. And this uh, lead to uh, disuse of uh, rosiglitazone until 2013. There is a record trial uh, which uh, failed to reproduce the results from uh, 2007 meta-analysis and indicated no elevated risk of heart attack or death in patients being treated with rosiglitazone. Proactive trial bioglitazone treatment resulted in non-statistically significant 10% uh, relative risk reduction 
in uh, primary endpoint and uh, statistically significant, significant 16% uh, in uh, secondary endpoints. So what is the potential, potential difference between uh, both molecules, bioglitazone and rosiglitazone, and why their effects may distinct from each other? Because they uh, act by different ways on lipo, uh, lipoproteins. So bioglitazone has, uh, has more beneficial effect as triglyceride decreased by 15%, HDL increased by 10%, and no effect on LDL or total cholesterol. While rosiglitazone uh, increases the LDL by 5 to 10 percent and also the total cholesterol. In Chicago's study, bioglitazone slowed the progression of carotid intima media sickness, and in Briscoe's study, bioglitazone led to uh, uh, regression in coronary aceroma volume assessed by intravascular ultrasound. So despite this impressive cardiovascular benefit with bioglitazone therapy, its use has been declined markedly and potentially due to guilt by association with rosy glitazone. And what is the side effects of both uh, bioglitazone and uh, rosy glitazone? Uh, first of all, the weight gain. The weight gain from one to three kilos is common in patients taking long-term TZDs uh, other than uh, anti-diabetic drugs and the greater weight gains up to five kilos maybe uh, when used in combination with insulin therapy. As well as the edema, uh, the bioglitazone increased the incidence of edema by 15.3% compared to insulin alone, uh, which was 7%. Therefore, the incidence of edema is higher when either TZDs are combined with insulin compared with other anti-diabetic drugs. So here, the patients with NEHA functional class three or four heart failure should not receive TZDs. So this is an important information here. And uh, uh, we talk about the another group, the alpha glucosidase inhibitor, uh, which are not uh, used so much nowadays. Uh, they act by inhibition of alpha glucosidase, which is important in the intestinal mucosa that uh, uh, important for absorption of, uh, of carbohydrate to, into monosaccharides. So uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors reduce the impact of dietary carbohydrate on blood sugar. And this is also meta-analysis in 2019, and it showed uh, that uh, the impact of uh, alpha glucosidase inhibitors uh, on cardiovascular outcomes is neutral. And it's clear that can, they cannot be indicated for cardiovascular secondary prevention. And many countries uh, up to date uh, have licensed uh, them as a use in impaired glucose tolerance. And also they uh, may delay or prevent new onset diabetes in people with or without pre-existing cardiovascular disease. And lastly, we talk about the insulin. Uh, the outcomes with insulin therapy have been also in consistence across studies. Exogenous insulin for treatment of type 2 diabetes has, has been shown to decrease the microvascular complications such as retinopathy, nephropathy, and neuropathy, but not shown to lower the risk of macrovascular complications include myocardial infarction and the cardiovascular death. And a lot of large observational studies found that Injected insulin dose proportionally increased all-cause mortality. And also the Euroheart survey found that patients with type 2 diabetes and coronary artery disease insulin doubled mortality as compared to oral glucose lowering drugs. And this also was consistent with the AGME 2 study as there is twofold increase in non-fatal cardiovascular events and a trend for intensified insulin treatment to increase in mortality. So the bigger dose of insulin you give, the more uh, fatality you have. And the, the ACCORD study, which used insulin to uh, insulin or, or, or other the oral antidiabetic drugs to decrease uh, hemoglobin uh, A1C to less than 6%, uh, which is extremely tight, uh, it was halted due to increase mortality and intensive glycemic control arm. So if you have a patient with a long-standing type, uh, type 2 diabetes and the patient is high risk, don't bring hemoglobin A1C below 6%.
and also mortality associated with insulin followed a U-shaped uh, curve. Uh, your, your A1C favorable to be around 7 or 7.5 to avoid risk such as severe hypoglycemia. And if you want to bring the A1C below 7.5, it may be safer to use the new drugs, uh, the SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP agonists like empagliflozin, cangliflozin, loraglutide, semaglutide, or bioglitazone, as they proven to reduce the cardiovascular risk. And what is the adverse events or adverse effects of exogenous insulin? First of all, hypoglycemia, as we discussed before, and its delicious effect on uh, the cardiovascular mortality. And also the etriogenic hyperinsulinemia. As you all know that uh, the problem in type 2 diabetes is not a deficiency of insulin rather than the insulin uh, resistance. So you have a, a state of hyperinsulinemia. So when you give an exogenous insulin, you exacerbate this condition. And over insulinization may uh, have a wide range of physiological effects, including insulin resistance, weight gain, and dyslipidemia. Hyperinsulinemia has been shown to increase also the risk of cardiomyopathy and atherosclerosis. And the last effect is the weight gain. So now we go for the conclusion. Patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus have an inherent elevated risk for cardiovascular disease. Metformin are encouraging with studies showing reductions in any diabetes-related endpoint, diabetes-related death, and all-cause mortality. Evidence for the safety of sulfonylurea therapy is still conflicting. Sulfonylurea use has been associated with, with an increased risk of developing heart failure, especially at higher doses and also in first and old generations of sulfonylurea. The TCD bioglitazone has, all, uh, has been shown to lower the composite all-cause mortality, non-fatal myocardial infarction and stroke in patients with type 2 diabetes and the high risk for macrovascular events. Rosiglitazone is contraindicated in patients with heart failure as it has been shown to increase the risk of heart failure. And finally, the insulin therapy for type 2 diabetes causes hyperinsulinemia, hypoglycemia, and weight gain and associated with adverse cardiovascular outcomes and should be used only when absolutely necessary to achieve glycemic control. And thank you.